Hey friends, in today's video, we're doing a dirty pour. These were really popular a few years ago and I've done a few before, but I thought it might make a fun video. For those who aren't aware, dirty pouring is a technique in which acrylic paint is thinned down and poured, usually over a canvas. I thought it might also be fun to touch on the science behind what's happening in this technique. I actually went to college for a biochemistry degree, for those who don't know, and I minored in chemistry. So I think it'd be really fun to start incorporating some science into my videos, especially ones like this, where there's actually a lot of science behind what's happening. And if you know the science, maybe it could help you get good results, but um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But the technique itself is super easy. You can get good results even without knowing really what you're doing. Basically, you take paint, you dilute it a bit, maybe add some silicone and throw it on a canvas. And most of the time you get some really beautiful results. So first off, the main principle at work is the Raleigh, Rayleigh, I'm so bad at pronouncing names, Taylor instability, which is also really important in astrophysics, believe it or not. This principle basically says that when a denser fluid rests atop a less dense one, the top fluid wants to move downward, causing the two fluids to mix. So this is actually pretty logical when you think about it. The more dense object or fluid is going to want to be on the bottom and the lighter one or less dense one is going to want to be on the top. So that's pretty, you know, it makes sense, common sense. But if you want to think about it like a salad dressing, when you have the watery component and an oily component, the oil is always going to go to the top. No matter how much you shake it, it'll eventually separate out and the oil's going to rise to the top. And so that's why when you add silicone to these paints, which is found in a lot of hair products, so like anti-frizz products have silicone and stuff, and that's personally what I use when I do these because it's cheaper than buying like silicone. I don't know where you would buy it, but I think like a hardware store or something, maybe you could find it. So I use that and that's what gives you the cells that everybody always talks about. And what's happening is the oil in the silicone is rising to the top of the paint, which makes a little bubble that'll pop and it reveals the paint layer underneath. So you can also add e heat to force the bubbles up and help them pop. I find when you use heat, normally you get a lot of really small bubbles, but it depends on how high your heat is. Just use a heat gun or even a hair dryer would probably work if you just turn the heat setting on. It doesn't need to be super intense. So in the paint, there are three main components, pigment, binders, and solvents. Depending on all of these things, some paints are just generally going to be more or less dense than others. And that's even if they're in the same line of paint. So you see here, I actually have a couple different paints. So I have the Liquitex Liquitex um, Basics, and then I also have a Liquitex Heavy Bodied. Heavy Bodied obviously is going to be more dense uh, just because it's a heavier body. So I added more of the solvent or the medium that I added to it to dilute it more and make it more liquidy just because it wouldn't have flow very well uh, otherwise. The Basics tend to be a little bit more liquidy natural but even with the different pigments, some pigments are higher density than others. So it's really even within the same line, you're going to have some paints that are higher density than others. But if you do play around with different brands, you might notice some more unusual effects depending on how those paints were actually manufactured and what additives and stuff they have in them. So when you add the binder and the pigment together, they create a texture that's really similar to rubber cement and that's why you have to add solvents and all those things obviously are already mixed by the time we get the paints and that's why sometimes when you get paints um, in the tube it'll like start to separate out almost and you have to kind of mix it a bit so the solvent is obviously a th uh, thinner and it makes your paints less viscous and as it sits the solvents will evaporate and allow the paint to dry and that's why some paints dry faster than others so acrylic tends to dry pretty fast the solvent um, evaporates a little bit faster watercolor is kind of hit or miss obviously you're um, adding water to the paints a lot of times the paint is dry or if you're using wet watercolor there is an additive to keep it wet um, oil obviously has a lot of oil in it. So the oil paints take forever to dry because oil is not going to evaporate as quickly. So as it sits out, it'll evaporate, the paint will dry. So what's really interesting, as I said before, is that the pigments even have different densities and the, the solvents, if it's a different brand, might have slightly different densities. So it's really interesting to think about. This technique, even though it's popular 
right now or a few years ago. I know I saw it starting to get really big a few years ago. It actually became popular in like the 1930s and that's when it really began. There was a Mexican artist. I'm going to butcher his name, but I'm going to try. David Alfaro Siqueiros or something like that. He called it accidental painting when he stumbled across it and he noticed that depending on the different pigments and the paints he was using, it would flow differently and you didn't have to put a lot of effort in to get beautiful results. And it was just kind of a happy accident as Bob Ross might say. So this technique actually went on to inform the work of other artists like Jackson Pollock, which is interesting because he's definitely a lot more famous than uh, David Alfaro as far as I'm aware. I've never heard of this guy before but I feel like everyone's heard of Jackson Pollock. Anyway, regardless of the science and the history behind this art form, it's really easy to do. I will say the Liquitex um, medium that I use to dilute, it is kind of expensive. I have had success in the past using water, but you have to be a little more careful. Sometimes it'll change the texture of the acrylic. Um, it'll definitely make it flow faster. Definitely experiment though, because I have done one with water and it turned out beautifully. So you can do it. You just might have a slightly different texture on your canvas. Um, anyway, it's, it's an easy one. And if you have acrylic paint laying around and you don't know what to do with it and you want to do something artistic that doesn't require a lot of mental thought or preparation, try it out. Um, let me know how it goes in the comments if you do this or tag me on Instagram. All my handles are in the description and above all else, have fun. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.